Hello? Hello. How you doing, dude? Good. Good. That's what I like to hear. You pumped? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. man. Don't uh don't sound too excited now. So why are you here, man? What's the deal? I'm Devon Four and just trying to keep improving. What uh MMR is that exactly, sorry? Five point three. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh continue. I'm just trying to reach immortal. And that kind of want to know what I need to work on. Nice. What role you play? Uh, position one. Nice. Okay. Uh, and do you have anything in mind, or do you just want me to look at your games and figure it out from there? Uh, I have a PA replay of like. Uh, nice. Like I feel like this game was a like normal game for me, the way that it went. Okay. We did win though. No, that's fine. You can always give wins. I think there's almost always something to learn from a Dota game, unless it's just a. 20 minute, you know, won the lanes, walk down mid, end game kind of mid, or end game kind of game. Let me uh, go and share screen with you. Uh, Do you see what I see, buddy? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so, yeah, obviously it looks like a pretty good game, but not does not mean we can't learn something. So, uh, we'll see what we see. And anything that comes glaring out to me, I'll try to mention things I think you're good to go on. If I see them, like, eh, yeah, you're fine on that. If there's stuff uh, there that I don't see, then or that I see that you're not fine on, we will harp on it a lot. So, let's see. Sounds good. Uh, pretty standard stuff. So, you are most likely against, like, Grimstroke Doom, is what we think. Maybe Jakiro Doom. So, I'm fine with these items. Because you're against, like, you don't need a salve against a lane that's just kind of damage over time. Your back row's good. Not too concerned about CSing under tower, that kind of stuff doesn't matter to me. Like, if there's something glaringly bad about what you're doing, it would matter, but... So far, so good. So lane mechanics look pretty good. It's always surprising to me how certain like people at your MMR have like terrible laning stages, and other people have like terrible other stuff. So clearly, the problem is not going to be your lanes. Like obviously, your laning isn't perfect, but if it was like clearly holding you back, I'd say something here. Um, usually, I see PAs go one one one. By the way, it's not like something I think is like yet to follow to a T, but. I've seen a lot of PAs go for the 1-1-1, one, 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 just because it gives you some aggression potential. Uh, so your support's pulling. It also saves you from shit like that. Yeah. I was gonna say it's more defensive, but I was gonna kinda wait till it showed up. So just something to consider, like generally speaking, uh, with skill builds on carries, like especially in this lane, I'd value Blink Strike even more. Like I probably would go at level two simply because of the the Grimstroke nuke. And maybe that's something you realized after the Grimstroke E, something you realized after the lane. But like whenever I go into lanes, I think very like at your level, you're starting to get to the point where you have to think very specifically about what you're dealing with, like exactly what could go wrong, who kills you, how you die, how you like lose trades, when you win trades. Like, uh, for instance, like, if Doom proved himself to have Scorched Earth, then, like, you can look to try to force him to Scorched Earth and then back off kind of thing, and then you know when it's on cooldown, you're at the advantage. Just, like, little things like that. So, like, when I look at this lane, I would always have Blink Strike level 2 because of Grimstroke, and then I would never Blink Strike aggressively unless Grimstroke's already used his uh, Ink Swell, right? Like, uh, somebody I coached last week played Slark, they are about your MMR, 
and they pounced a Grimstroke lane when the Grimstroke still had Inkswell, and then they just lost the trade. And that's the kind of stuff that it's really important that you think about going into a lane as much as possible. Maybe Grimstroke's, you know, you're just not used to that much laning against Grimstroke, but whenever I play against Grimstroke, my primary issue I worry about is the, is the Inkswell. Okay, so... PA is not a, like usually when I'm picking carries against Grimstroke, I'll pick something that doesn't die to the ink swell. Like it doesn't just get ink swelled and guaranteed to get hit for 300 nuke damage or whatever. I guess they kind of nerfed it, but it's still very scary. Yeah. Uh, okay, pull. Nice. I uh, got a little unlucky with the skeleton shit. That's okay, those still pulled. I was actually going to say, I, I, don't, I wasn't sure how I felt about this pull, but I see what you're doing, so let me rewind. Let me rewind a bit more. So lane's pushed out. I guess this is actually okay. I feel like in this spot I'd almost always prefer a small camp pull, but since you think you're getting, like, tri lane or whatever, it's probably best you just pull the lane back. Just because when you're doing this, you have to be a little bit careful of, like, you're giving the enemy team a creep camp, and, like, there's no way you're contesting them. So, like, if possible, I would have probably just went and stack pulled the small camp. Uh, even though it delays the wave a little bit more, it's like the only time I really want to pull the big camp is when I feel like I can either control it or at least, like, heavily contest it. You know what I'm saying? Like, when yeah. I'm. Yeah, okay, cool. Don't need to explain any further than that. This is good. This was, like, the first part. I ended up just going to shrine. I, like, panically used the shrine. I felt like I should have just, like, do I, if I just go top, it's, like, still so awkward. I feel like I should just stay here and, like, pull, right? Um. But I feel like I just get dove if I pull. It's actually so awkward. So, here's what I do, okay? So, like, uh, let me rewind to this moment where you have to make this decision, right? So, right now, I feel like you haven't really had time to process it, meaning, like, you're not in extreme danger, like Doom's not level six or anything. So when I'm thinking, yeah. when I'm thinking like this, like I'm thinking about when the offlaner really threatens me a lot. So like the minute Doom gets six, if I see like a support or two, like looking to do this shit, I just have to leave, right? Like that's immediately when I have to leave. But you're not in this spot yet. You're, Doom's not level six, so I want them to have to prove that they have a lot of resources here. So like if I, I this at this spot, I'm fine with what you're doing. Like you see Doom, you know they're going to be aggressive. Why do we know they're going to be aggressive if they're any good? By the way, I'm just being clear. Catapult. Okay, cool. So we know they're going to be aggressive on us. They are like good players, at least we'll always try to do this. So, like, I'm going to start creep aggroing defensively like you're doing. Like, this is important. So I'd even try not to get hit by that, like even letting him hit you, but that's fine. Whatever. So they're looking to dive you, but you use your blink strike on creeps and we're all good. And you know there's three heroes here. And so this is a spot where, surprisingly enough, because they used Inkswell and Doom's only level 4, you're just playing way too scared right now. Like, you should actually just be... What I would do here is when your creeps get to their range, I'm fording my own wave, and then, um... And then, like, defending, basically. Um, and the reason why it's so important to fort your own wave is because not only does it, like, keep your wave alive under tower, but it'll also, like, mitigate the damage of the catapult. And that wave is really important to you because it gives you um, a blink strike out. Like, that, that's what it, like you can juke them through the trees again. So what I would be doing is I would walk to, like, right here. I'd fort the creep wave and then stall out. And the only reason you're allowed to do this right now is because their main source of actually getting you is, is, like, on cooldown. So, like, if he hadn't inkswelled yet, I might be more hesitant to stay. But I think you're just overly scared. Like, they used their shit. They tried to dive you, and they failed. So now, like, just chill. You don't have to do anything other than maybe dagger some creeps because you're still getting solo XP under your own tower when they have three heroes. So if you're not under a ton of threat to die, right, there's no reason to panic. And I, I know you heard me, or I, I heard what you said. So if this Doom was level six here, or, like, for whatever reason you're in a lane that's way more threatening, what do you think I should immediately consider? Like, if, if, I'm, if I'm really threatened in this lane right now? TPing out. Okay, and where would I usually TP when I'm to not? The Bloodseeker lane. Yeah, to the Bloodseeker lane. So what should I consider about that? Basically, I look at my Sand King and I look at their Bloodseeker and I say, like, if I show up here, am I ruining Sand King's game? So like, I would beg to differ that if you had to, this would be a really good TP. And why do you think that is? 
Like if you if uh, let's let's rule out the fact that you're not allowed to stay in your lane anymore. Okay, like in this case, I think you should have stayed because of the reasons I gave you. But let's say those reasons don't apply. Like you actually have to leave your lane. Why do you think going to this lane right now is actually really good? We have supports up there. We oh. definitely will kill them. Okay, potentially kill them. So that's nice. But who's winning the lane? The Bloodseeker. Okay, so the Bloodseeker's winning. But has Bloodseeker hit a point where he's really strong yet? No. No. Like, yeah, I, mean, I don't actually know the new Rupture very well. But the point is, like, if this was a level 5 Slark, for instance, same idea. Like, a very common hero, you'll see this patch. It's really nice of you to show up in this guy's lane if you have to. Like, if you have nothing better to do. It's, nothing to sh it's nice to show up in his lane when he's level 4 and the Slark's level 5 because, in this case of Bloodseeker, same thing. I'm just giving you a more common example. You'll see this patch probably. That's really nice because the Slark's not strong enough to deal with two cores at the moment. But he also doesn't want to leave. Like, Bloodseeker and Slark are heroes that don't want to rotate. You know what I'm saying? They want to just sit there yeah. farming for a while. So if you know that, the way I always try to think about it is if I was there, carry, what would I want to do? Like when I like review my own replays, like and I'm watching, think like this is a hard decision to make. The one you're in right now, this is like uh, stuff that I'll still mess up. So like occasionally. So it's like one of those things where your goal is to get it right as often as possible. So in this case, like I just look at their carry. If this carry was like a, uh, you know, level six. Slark, level 6 Bloodseeker, you know, level 6 PL, or whatever, like a very hard hero for you to deal with, then it makes it a lot less likely that you'd rotate. But let's say, I'm just doing this to cover our bases to help you out, because this is a question you had, and you made the wrong decision here, so we might as well talk about our options. So, let's just say that's a carry you don't want to show up to their lane. Where, do you want to stay in your own jungle in this own, in this case, really? With this type of thing going on? Like, do you want to stay here? Probably not. I'm Probably kind not. I'm just getting a free tower then. Yeah, so our options are... I'm going to try to describe this. So if they make this big of a commitment to your lane, you want to try to get something out of it. So the only times you're not going to get anything out of it is if your off lane's just getting absolutely demolished, your mid lane's losing, like you just lost all three lanes, pretty much, is when you should get nothing. So the way I look at it is, if I see this type of thing, and I don't want to stay, so I first have to ask myself if I want to stay. If the option's yes, because we already decided in this game it was, then you have to stay. If the option's no, you're, in my opinion, if they make this big of a commitment, your two options and 90% of games are to either go to this lane and immediately deal with this guy, like immediately go do something to their carry, or just TPing here and farming this area until you're strong enough to do something to that guy. So like uh, maybe you're, you're a carry that needs six first. So, or like PA's case, like her six is nice, but it, it doesn't like make her way stronger kind of thing. But you'll see a lot of pros. What happens is they want to go to the opponent off lane and so at that point, their only decision is, do I want to farm here until I am strong enough to be here, or am I strong enough to be here? And then they'll show up in the lane. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, the only exception to that really is if uh, you want to like farm your way to top. And generally, that's like if they make a much less commitment here. Like if they have one or two heroes here, but you know you can't stand in lane. Like what if it's just Doom and you don't want to be in lane? So in that case, maybe you just walk your way while farming to your way top, okay? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, cool. So that's just helping you with this decision. So that, like, what I said about the, um, like, what can go wrong in lane and stuff, uh, about the Grimstroke uh, Inkswell, it also, like, the reason why I harp on people for making that kind of decision incorrectly in lane is because the same decision applies here. Like, what kills me? Like, what actually threatens me if I'm going to defend this tower? And so, if you had thought about it that way, like, if he has no Inkswell, think about it. What do they actually do if you just walk away? You know, you have, you don't have boots, I guess, so that kind of matters. Um, but at the same time, you're a pretty high move speed hero. And I feel like if you're not in melee range of Doom, I don't see how they actually get you here. You know what I'm saying? So, think about it that way to yourself, and it'll help you a lot uh, for stuff. Like this. So you give up the... Let's see what you end up doing. So you should... That, that was obvious. You said it was a panic shrine. That was. Definitely. But they're obviously being inefficient here. So the reason why it was, it's big that you don't leave when you have to... Or, sorry. 
the reason why it's big that you don't leave when you don't have to is because if you had left, suddenly maybe they take your tower with two heroes when they shouldn't be able to, right? So it's nice that you, you should... If you're not sure, I usually stay and see what happens. Like, I usually make the mistake of staying too long rather than leaving just for the sake of understanding, like... If you leave, it's hard to know what would have happened if you stayed. So I try to be very confident in whether or not I should have stayed. And the only way to find out if you're not really sure is by staying, in my opinion. So um, that's the way I've learned. It obviously is going to get you killed. Like, it's the less safe way to play. Meaning, you know, we talk about this being the dangerous lane, the dead lane and stuff. But, like, if you think you're allowed to stay, I recommend trying to stay. That's my best way to harp or to trim up that decision making, because it's a tough decision to make. Okay, so fast forwarding. Doom's only level five. Pull again. So I definitely think if you're scared of laning, so the lanes up here, and you just don't want to be here. Let me rewind. So if the lane looks like this, okay. I need to do the math, actually. I believe, if I'm correct, you know, I'm Googling this for us because this is, this is nice knowledge here. Let me Google this. Dota 2 neutral camps. I did a video on this once, but let me just give you the exact here. Uh, small camps. That's what I thought. So small camps, on average, give about 110 exper experience. So a wave gives about 200, okay? So if you feel like the lane's in, like in a bad spot for you and you just don't want to be there, like this doesn't feel good, right? Because you know if he has a support with him, the second you walk up, he's just going to run at you, right? And there's nothing yep. you can really do about it. And so that's kind of how I think about it. Like if he has extra help with him, who, who benefits? Like there's times where even if he has help, yeah, the worst case scenario is you kind of just walk away. But in this case, like you, he, he, as long as he continues chasing you, you have to keep walking away. Which is like really annoying. So you don't want that. So in these spots, like it's only obviously there's only two creeps here, which is kind of random. But if you go pull the small camp and farm it, maybe even chain pulling, depending on where the wave is. At worst case scenario, you're losing a hundred experience, and then the waves reset to your tower. So like you're not giving up all that much to put the lane back to here. Um, the way that I try to explain it to people is. I'm like way overly efficient. Like whenever I do anything, I'm really efficient player. Like I try to be efficient and it can actually be very bad is what I'm trying to say is like, I personally would not make these kind of choices because I knew I'd be giving up this creep wave in the short term. But what I've seen like from time and time again, from people that I've played on teams with and from own experience of learning from it is if there's a problem, it's worth giving up a small amount of a small amount of farm gold XP whatever to fix it and then you'll feel much better like it's just way better like it's way better to give up this hundred experience and put the creep wave back to your tower than it is to try to milk this much experience because if you die one out of 20 times doing this it's just not worth it like it it just isn't um, like you'll it ruins your game sometimes to die in these spots so rather than having one out of 10 one out of 20 of your games get completely ruined you see the lane look like this. You just go pull the small camp. Um, okay. If you don't understand that decision or you're not 100% positive on your own decision making on that one, that's something I had to watch better players do. I just had to watch. That was the only way. I had to watch them make this decision themselves and see how often they would go pull the small camp. It's very common for carries once their supports leave them alone to have to pull their own small camp. Like, look at what you're having to do. Wouldn't you have rather just pulled your small camp and then not have to deal with this anymore? And, like, yeah, you could try to pull this big camp on raiding. It's kind of nice. But at the same time, like, this happens a lot. So, like, the small camp's still very reliable um, to reset the lane. It's, you're not doing it as much for the farming of the small camp. The small camp farm is nice. You're just doing it so the wave comes under your tower. And then what that does is prevents this from happening. So why does pulling the small camp prevent this from happening? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. So what happens is, I'm going to rewind for you. Like, I'm telling you right now, you're getting dove because you didn't pull the small camp at 810. Um, so what happens when you pull the small camp is, does the small camp kill your wave? No. So what happens is you effectively delay your own wave from getting to this one by, what, 10, 15 seconds? Something like that. So what happens is their wave doubles up. 
your wave gets delayed, and then they meet each other right here, underneath your own tower. So you have a creep wave that's meeting theirs out underneath your own tower. So then what happens? Do you know? Say it again. So they have a double wave, or like six creeps or something, five or six creeps, like a little more than one wave, that meets your wave under your own tower, because you single pulled. Okay. Okay. So try to follow me. You now have four creeps or three creeps from your own single pull, depending on the camp, that now come back to the lane late, okay? Like, they just, you delayed them. They, they're still there, but they're coming late, right? So now that they come late, they meet these creeps plus, like, like or sorry, like two of these creeps plus these four underneath your own tower. And so what happens is your wave is now killing theirs underneath your own tower. So what happens to the lane equilibrium? It'll push out. It'll push back out. Yeah. Guess what happens when the lane's pushed out? I get dove. You don't get dove. When do you get dove? Where's the lane? When it's under my tower, I get dove? Yeah, yeah, when it's close to your tower, you get dove. I assure you, you will never get dove if this lane is here. Oh, because the doom's gonna farm it. Yeah, the doom's, like, it's gonna be yeah. so fucking obvious to you that he's diving you, right? Like, you'll see him coming from a mile away. It's just not happening. So, like, the reason why it's even better to single pull on your own, um, on your own safe lane is because it causes a lot of uh, volatility in the, in the equilibrium. Like, it makes it so the lane that was previously here is now going to be here. And then because it was here, it's now going to be here again. So, like, it makes it very difficult to dive you. Um, like, you may run into scenarios you're not familiar with because you haven't single pulled enough or whatever. But th this just doesn't happen. Like, I, I can assure you this, this kind of stuff. Like, I, I was trying to figure out why this seemed to be happening to me and none of the carries I watched that were better than me. And it almost has exclusively to do with single pulling the, the small camp when the lane's in a bad spot. So that's an example of a death that happens um, because of not fixing a problem when you could have. Um, so now you TP back to a lane with a Doom 6. I don't know about that. Let's see what happens. He uses Doom, which is nice of him. I just wouldn't be here in the first place. Let's see how it works out for you. So this is a spot where I would love to TP or walk, depending on... Because I'm against Bloodseeker, I might even TP. Or sorry, I might even walk top. I don't want to go bottom because Doom 6. So even though you guys kill Doom, like... I don't think, as a carry player, at 10 minutes into the game, you want to be level 6 fighting against 3 heroes that are all yeah, your level. I, yeah, I agree. Okay, cool. So as long as you agree with that. So this is a spot where, do I want to TP top and just static farm that wave? No, I think you do the offline jungle, right? Yeah, you do this thing, right? Yeah. So... That's the beauty of what I said earlier, is the same decision you're making at like 7 or 8 minutes, you're once again making when you die and respawn. So you're like, do I want to go back to my safe lane? Why or why not? In the times when I'm on stream and I say, that death wasn't all that bad. Like, yeah, I shouldn't have died, but that death wasn't that bad. Because I can just walk back to my lane anyway. Or like, I just, I can still occupy my lane. The deaths that are like really bad, or like even more costly, is like when Doom was level 5 and you died. Because now he's level 6, and... If you go back, it's just not good. You may not die again necessarily like this, but you're not happy with going back to that lane. So it's made even worse by that death that you had. So those type of deaths are more costly than the ones where, you know what I'm saying, where sometimes you die and it doesn't change anything about the lane. It's not like yeah. good, but it doesn't change anything. So this is a spot where I'm making the decision now. I don't want to go back. So we've established that because of this, right? We've established that. If the enemy team's any good, not only is Doom going to have level 6, but they're going to have supports with him because they know he's level 6, so they're going to show up to his lane because they know he's strong. And then um, OD's not really a mid laner you gank for, so that's kind of out of the picture. And then, so now you're stuck with this lane, and as we talked about, you decide whether or not you want to go static farm the lane or you want to farm near the lane. Because the reason that this is nice is if you farm here and you see this shit happening bottom, you immediately run top and say, Sand King, I'm behind you. If Bloodseeker's here, let's go. Like, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. That's the kind of stuff you can say. Because you are both strong enough. Like, he's not going to solo kill the Bloodseeker, right? But um, with you two combined and his epicenter, I'm pretty sure you can at least force people out of this. Like, you can force them here. And so one of the strong things about why I would TP... Why would... So what goes into my decision to TP or walk here? 
if you want to fight bottom, maybe. That's if true. Wanna... That's true. That's so I if I'm if Doom is six, and I TP here, and force a fight on Bloodseeker, and the fight's happening like right here, and Doom TP's top, how do I feel about that? You could just farm the offline jungle, and the SK could go bottom. Okay, so then they push your tower because Dekiro TPs, then what? That's pretty bad then. Okay, how about we walk top, do the exact same shit if Doom TPs, we just TP back to our nice safe lane here. That was not safe because Doom was there. So then wouldn't you always want to walk then? Because they could always do that play, right? Yes and no. So like... I don't know how to explain it better, but you have no threat on Doom. Am I right? Yeah. That's but he threatens you a lot. So in that case, you should behave like this. There are games where you actually threaten the offlaner, even though he also threatens you. Okay. So, like, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but, like, if the Doom were to TP top and you were... Okay, now, I don't want to say Doom, because he's, like, a bad example. If it's, like, Brewmaster that TPs top or something, and it's, like, a hero that if you force him there... And you're a slark. Doesn't mean you necessarily want to fight him, but is he going to, like, dive you or anything? No. No. So, like, you don't mind bringing him top, because that means it's stopping him from pushing bottom. But then you'll stay top. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, you have no desire to be on the same half of the map as Doom. So if you have no desire to stay on the same half of the map as Doom, you don't want to TP somewhere. And that's... After this, these two sessions I'm doing, I'm literally talking about teleport scrolls. So I might use this as an example. Like, like this matchup. It's really important to think like the impact you have towards each other, towards each core. Like uh how do I do against this guy? How do I do against this guy? How does this guy impact my decision on diving or not? Um like certain times like if I'm against a uh, OD mid, for instance, like the opponent has an OD, am I all that concerned about trying to dive the opponent with like a jug or a PA or a slark or something? He's probably not going to TP. He he's not going to TP. He's a fucking OD. And if he does TP, if I, like, I just have to play around the fact that I'm not going to get Astral. So I can't let him TP in and Astral me, right? Like, that's all I have to prevent. So in that case, what if they have a puck mid, right? Then I'm way more hesitant to dive because they have a puck. So I don't want to... Last thing I want to do is, like, if I dive and I'm in TP le coil range of a puck, I'm probably dead. So, I like, and that's an insta-cast... Like, long-range spell, she has lots of chase, like, I'm not going to dive nearly as much against a puck. So I'm giving you an example for teleport scrolls, like, I don't want to use my TP scroll to get anywhere against a Doom, because, or a Bloodseeker, really, because if it's a Bloodseeker and I force him to rupture, what if I'm really strong against Bloodseeker as long as he can't rupture me? Like, let's just say that. And he ruptures me right here. I, I could just TP right here. Like, because I plan to stay there, but because he doesn't have rupture anymore. And now the rupture is a longer cooldown, right? Yeah, it is. So it's basically a TP duration, uh, TP cooldown. So like, if he were to rupture, if I walk top, he ruptures me. I can actually just TP to my own tier one and reserve and reserve and resume playing that lane because it's on, his only threat on me is because he has rupture. You see what I'm saying here? All these things go into my decision making. So like, yeah, there's a lot of factors, right? And the thing is, you're 5.3k. Usually, people around your tier or higher know enough about dota where if i ask them the right questions they can give the right answers so now it's a matter of what happens is if you start asking yourself these questions every single time you get in this scenario you'll start processing things quicker it's important to know when you saw those three heroes being aggressive on you bottom what are your options it's in like go through the chain of options like i'd rather stay here so can i stay here no okay like or like th that case i would look and see their carry like if i look and see their carry and it's a Carry I can't really land against, that makes me less likely to want to go top. If it's a carry that is like Monkey King and he's missing, I'm probably going to leave because he could just be bottom already. And if he's already bottom, I'm not going to have the option to leave later because he's on top of trees and he'll see me and shit. So, like, that's something to consider. And it's like all these things. The, there's so many questions to ask yourself in these regards. If you start asking yourself the questions, it becomes second nature the second the time. Like, every time this my wave's up here, I, like, innately ask myself if I want to pull. Like, am I okay with the lane right here? Like, because if I'm okay with it, then I'm just going to do my thing. But if I'm not okay with it, usually you only have three or four seconds to process that you're not okay with it. Like, by the time, my goal would be that you would eventually 
first step would be that you think you should pull and you're like two or three seconds late. And then next time around, you're not late. You know, like that that's what happens for me at least. I'm always a little slow with my decision. And then once I get it down, I'm faster. So let's go ahead and fast forward. Sorry. I harped on that subject, but it's a, it's a big subject. Uh, really useful though. Yeah, like this is a this is like this is a big waste, right? Like the reason why we harp on these type of things so much and why I'm gonna talk about why I decided my next video is going to be on TP scrolls is because one misuse of a TP scroll dictates 80 seconds of your game. Like minimum. Minimum. And sometimes it can be even worse. Um, like and like things like pulling the small camp when you're supposed to. That ruined your game 60 seconds later. Like you died 60 seconds later because you didn't pull. Um, and that's just things where people don't see the impact of like they just see themselves dying underneath their own tower. And they don't see like why it happened. And so that's why these type of decisions, I harp on them so much because I like after, you know, it's not like I suddenly one day realized that, right? This is me studying or having somebody told me this stuff, you know? Um, it's really hard to see the uh, cause of what's going wrong in Dota. So you force that. I don't mind this. This is good. So one thing I see really good carry players do, like really good carry players, is they'll force some sort of ability usage or reaction. So you see two supports bottom and you see a fight going on top. This is like a good example of why this is a good rotation. Like you just see two supports, you know one of them TP'd, and you immediately go top and it turns into a good fight. Even though Doom is respawning, like you just don't care because you see two of their supports. Okay, so you see Doom. Okay. Is this an X Sword Invoker? Yes. Okay. So I like this decision. You need to go do something. I was considering, like, should you contest the Invoker or not? And I think this is what you're doing is fine. You need to, like, force somebody to show up somewhere. Like, when you don't want to go to your safe lane, the best thing you can do is force them to go somewhere. So you force the Invoker mid, which allows you to go top. You pick up the Bounty Runes, go to lane. Okay, you do. Good. No problem with what's going on here. I would personally be calling for a rotation to top lane. Um, it's a yeah. little bit tough for you to be confident in this kind of decision, but you see a lot of shit going on bottom, like constantly in the last like five yeah. minutes. And the reason why I was like kind of deliberating with myself, um, like this whole time about like how I felt about this invoker top, is I'm like, yeah, he's exhort, so he kind of threatens solo kill potential on you. But at the same time, with like one stun, you shit on him. Like you actually just kill him instantly almost. So it's like, when I think about that, like, when I'm in my games, if you watch my stream, I'm trying to validate, not validate, but, like, explain my statements that I'll make. If you or anyone else watching has heard me say stuff like, this guy shouldn't be allowed to do this. Like, I'm thinking to myself, they've been committing so many resources to bottom that it's been very clear that every time Invoker's been top, he's been alone. Like, I feel like, yeah. for me, that was clear, and I think you're agreeing. So, like, if he's alone, and you know with you plus one that he, at minimum, has to ghost walk and run away, like... Imagine how much control of the map you guys have with this lane pushed in, right? Like, that's how I explain it. Like, you get these extra three camps. You have a nice ward here, which opens up your rotation to potentially dive mid. Like, the what I've been explained to me recently and, like, uh, throughout the last year or so, but especially on, like, even from Team Runes I learned some of this stuff, is how important certain, like... Okay, how do I explain this? Uh, okay. One thing I learned very recently 
was how important it is. Let's just act like this tower is gone. So let's act like it's 20 minutes into the game, 25 minutes in the game. Both tier ones mid have been lost. And this exp this will help people understand why tier one towers are so important. So like if we've taken their tier one and they've taken ours, if the lane's right here, how do they invade your jungle? How do they invade this if the lane's here? They have to go up the ramps? They have to like go this way. They have to smoke. What if the lane's just right here? They can just walk. They can just walk. So like, what if? What about you invading their jungle? What if the lane's right here? How do you do it? I can just walk up. If the lane's right here? Well, I mean, not you have to go like specifically this way, right? Side ramp. Yeah, yeah. So if the lane's up here, what about invading this jungle or this jungle? Like I can go anywhere. Like I can walk through mid lane and decide where I want to go. If the lane is here instead of here. So like basically what I'm trying to say is that where lanes are on the map has a massive impact on who controls it and like what parts of the map are safe. Okay, so like when I look at when I look at this lane, if it's here, all of this is safe. And you can potentially go mid because you have this ward. But with the lane being here, none of this is good. Like, this ward doesn't actually do anything if the lane's here. If you think about it. Right? You see what I'm seeing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do. So, in these type of spots, like, you need to n start thinking about the impact of you against this guy again. So, it's the same idea that I came up with. Like, I, I felt uncomfortable about this invoker being allowed to be top. And maybe the first time it's fine. But I think at the bare minimum as a carry, what I've learned is you have to demand things. Like, if you think they need to be done. Okay? So... I look at this and say, this invoker shouldn't be allowed to do this. Can I get one top? And so you need to know. So the discipline that I don't always have that is ideal is you need to say, this guy's not allowed to be here. And if your teammates don't show up, what do you do? You have to play accordingly. You have to play accordingly. And that's something I don't do the best job of. Okay. So if they do show up, though, you kill this guy and boot him out. But you need to know why that's important. So I'm just trying to explain to you and everyone else how important it is that this lane's here rather than here. Okay, and it's the reason I gave you already. So, every lane, like, lane pressure is what decides the game, honestly. Like, if you understand lane pressure better than your opponents, you will win 90% of your pubs. I'm not exaggerating. If you understand it way better than your opponents, and I can tell you that people in your bracket do not understand it, okay? They don't. So, it's like one of their biggest issues. And I didn't understand it up until last year or so. So, and I was 7k, so if that says anything to anybody... Um, if you understand how important it is for each lane to be in a specific spot, that'll help you a lot with making your decisions on like calling for what you need, calling for wards, calling for help on ganks. You see a meteor. I think you just go on him there, by the way. I think the only reason he threatens you is because of uh, like tornado, meteor, sunstrike. I think you just Doesn't blink. He just go and miss him? I, what? Doesn't he just go and miss and walk away? Uh, so what's the negative impact if you do it? Like what happens to you? I guess nothing. He okay. Like 200 mana. Yeah, that's 200 mana. That's like what he has to do, right? Yeah. Like, think about that. That's something I never did either. So it's funny to me because I'm hearing myself like two years ago or some shit. <laughs> like, I'm just like, doesn't he just walk away? And it's like, well, yeah. Just watch. Like, I think one of the best players that doing it is actually Matumba Man. He's like in, in from the from the carry role. Matumba Man and Ramses are like really good at this. Like, they just know when a guy can't do anything to them. They're not like planning on getting a kill. They're just like make him use his abilities to defend himself and then he has half mana and what if a fight breaks out and now that guy has half mana instead of full mana um or no ghost walk cooldown you know something like that um it, it random times it pays off force people to use their own shit to defend themselves so like you should be calling for this ogre like you guys should just run at this guy um this ogre may not even have detection but even then look at this lane right same idea you're allowing this invoker to solo push on um, this lane. I've been on stream a bajillion times and talked about how we lost a game because we let a support defend this lane. Okay? Like, uh, this lane is the dead lane. Like, no memes. This is, like, they are not supposed to be able to defend this lane with one hero. Like, they are not allowed to do that with these heroes. If they have a puck that's unkillable or an ember that's unkillable, then that's some stuff you sometimes just have to play around, and sometimes you'll have to four-man gank them or whatever. But this guy has no business being allowed to defend this lane alone. Look at what he's allowing his team to do. If you allow one guy to defend this lane, you have no idea where Doom is, and the other heroes are allowed to group up. 
So, like, it makes it way harder for you guys to play the game. Your entire game is made difficult because this guy's allowed to do this. And you need to understand that, like, the way the Deadland concept and everything I'm trying to approach to you guys with it is, look at what you're forced to invest in your own safe lane. And look at what they're investing. And this is not good. Like, it's just not good. So, the best way I can explain it is, like, every time somebody's defending their own safe lane, think about how to prevent them from doing that. Some games you can't. Some games you need certain items. Some games you're just so far behind you can't stop it. Whatever. Like, the point is, in these type of games, it's very important to recognize that you can stop him from doing this. Like, just tell your ogre to walk at him with a stun. What happens if they for if you force two TPs from these guys? Great. Back off, right? Like, yeah. Like that's great. That's actually really good to just force some TPs. Suddenly, there's no pressure here. So, like, you're a hero that doesn't relieve pressure down here by going there. Right? Like, that's not really what your hero does. Your hero forces pressure here and by so that relieves pressure here. Does that make sense? Every hero yeah. is different. Like, Anti-Mage is the same way. Um, usually Slark, for the first 15 minutes of the game-ish, will relieve pressure on his own safe lane by being there, actually, because he's really hard to gank, and he can push out the lane himself, and he knows where the enemy team's wards are, so they're not going to, like find him underneath a ward in his own safe lane. That kind of stuff. Slark's a hero that will stay in his safe lane as long as he possibly can, almost all the time. So, okay. So you're going to farm top. About this entire thing is, I need you to understand how important it is that that top lane gets pushed. Uh, and since your ogre was there, it's like super convenient. But look at what's happening bottom. I assure you, if that top lane is at their tier 2, this kind of shit is not happening. You, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So if this lane is at their tier two, and you're here, and you see this, what are your choices? If this lane's here, at the shrine. Yeah, and you're like where you were. But you actually wouldn't be there. Sorry. This I lane's pushed in, and you're like here. The tower. You could potentially trade the tower, right? Like that's your yeah. choices. The point here is because you're not sufficiently pressuring this lane. When you looked at the map, what were your choices? Either fight bottom or like farm jungle. Yeah, farm jungle or fight bottom. And then in that case, you're not a potato, so you chose to fight, right? Like that's yeah. you're not gonna but farm. Like, I, I knew like the second I TP'd, I was like, this is like so shitty. Okay, so I need you and everyone else to wrap your head around this, okay? Every time you're in that spot, it is because you pressured lanes improperly. Okay. It is the two or so like Sometimes it can honestly be five minutes. Usually it's like a minute or two. It's the minute or two, two leading up to that that you played the map incorrectly and you allowed a lane to not be pressured. That's literally what it is. Like, uh, there's no... There, that is what it is. I've been lectured on this way too many times by teammates that are better than me. So, like, if you are as a carry are forced to make a decision you don't want to make in an evenish game, we're talking like you're not down by 12,000. You know, like you're not in a game that's just a nightmare. If you're in an even-ish game, it is because you could have pushed a lane when you didn't. That is why. So in this case, remember how I'm harping on this invoker shit top? That's why you're in this in awkward spot. Like, that's why I'm harping on it. I know it's going to lead to something. In every game, I don't know what it is, but I know it's going to lead to something, right? Like, something that you don't want. And so, if you have the ability to just push top instead of showing up to this fight because you have a battle fury, if you just push in top... And you see the Vite break out. You can start hitting the Tier 2. Do you have to stay there? Do you have to, like, hit the Tier 2 till it's dead? No. no. Yeah, you can just kind of back off, see what they do. If they stay together bottom, you can, you can, like, farm these two camps in the meantime, right? That's all you have to do. You can just farm these. And if you see that they stay bottom, then you clear the next wave. And you hit the tower three more times. And if they don't show up, you hit it more, right? right? But, like, eventually, one of them has to show up top. In the meantime you're potentially getting a free tier 2 and you're pressuring a wave and you're killing creeps. Like, you're getting a lot of farm. So, but, like, if you don't have this choice, any player in your spot, if they're not, like, raging or whatever, is just going to show up to this fight and it's not something you want. Maybe the fight goes well, sure. But, like, you that that's not a spot you want to put yourself in with a PA with a Battle Fury. So we're going to fast forward. So I like that you walk out of base. Surprisingly, doesn't happen very often. For all the reasons that I mentioned earlier, why I'm happy you walked out of base. So you see fight going on bottom. 
I will emphasize one last time that the only reason fights continue to go on bottom is because you are not pressuring top. Or just got to rupture you. You still have your own bottom. Blink on that guy. What's the point of having a TP and saving it coming out of base if you're not willing to blink on a Bloodseeker? Like, another example of... Oh, this is actually... This is your problem. I'm telling you, this is actually all of your problem. Okay, so like... Remember earlier with Invoker? If you blink on him and go, and he's forced to ghost walk away, who gets pressure on the lane? Me. You, because he's walking away ghost walked. And so if you do that to Invoker, and you do it to him because you just saw a Meteor, right? You just saw him use Meteor, so you know he's no longer a threat on you, right? Yeah. So in this case, you know Bloodseeker's not a threat on you because you just saw people bottom or mid, and um, you know you have a TP, so you can just... TP to Shrine or something, or TP to your own Tier 2, whatever, um, if he ruptures you. So in these, both of these cases, you know he's not a threat to you. So in, like, the Invoker case, he's maybe a threat to you with a plus one, right? Like, with somebody TPing in. So the amount of time you've bought yourself to push the wave is how long? In the Invoker scenario? Yeah. Like, uh, 15 seconds, maybe? More, rather than thinking about 15 seconds, I just think... How long it takes somebody to TP here and walk here? Like, yeah, you can say 15 seconds, but I'd rather you, like, in your mind have an internal clock of, like, how long it takes for somebody to get from here to here, here to here. Because at each pot, spot in the lane, it's different, right? Okay. You see what I'm saying? Like, uh, if yeah. you're at the Tier 2, maybe you have to leave immediately. Because if they TP here and you're not already on your way out, you're dead. Yeah. So, it's just, my point is, however long it takes them to TP and get to you. And certain heroes are different, right? If they have, you know, a Blink Sand King, like, it's going to take him a lot less time to get to you than a Doom that's just walking at you. So, like, that's an example of what I mean. So, every game is a little bit different. The point is, if you go on them and you know they're only a threat to you with a plus one, then you know you have as long as it takes for somebody on their team to get there in order to uh, pressure this guy. So, this is a guy that I just Blink on. Who gives a shit? Go on him. He has blade mail. Okay, you just stop hitting him. Like, you know, it's not like he threatens you. But, like, look at where this lane is. He showed three heroes mid and one hero just shown bottom. Look at your lanes, right? Like, this, like look at this. This is not good. And this Bloodseeker needs to get booted out. Like, if you hear me, like, listen for me if you're watching my stream. Hear me on times where, like, what the fuck is this guy doing? And you just, like, blink on him. Like, he's not allowed to do that. Like, if you really think about it, right? Like, they, yeah. this lane is super shitty, super dangerous for them. And all game, they've been allowed to push it alone. Um, and that's, like, the big deal here. So your team's actually playing, you know, around the right parts of the map. But uh, the, basically, I play these types of games. I see my team taking bad fights, and even in competitive matches. And I'm literally wondering, like, what the fuck's going on? Why are we always taking bad fights? It's actually 100% on you as a carry player. It's really, really alarming when I got taught this. Because I'm like, wow, it's actually my fault. Um, so... Look at this, like the lane would have been pressured out, none of this would be happening. Okay, pushing out. You see the mid. You can go one more wave. Cool. You force them top, that's good. You farm some neutrals. Your team definitely should be playing around you, like they should know, but at the same time, like, you're at a bracket where people don't know. So you kind of have to tell them, like, give me a support, like... Uh, if they don't listen, they don't listen, and that's life. And then at that case, just farm until you get six slotted. But like, okay, so I'm trying to explain this. So, have I made myself clear on why all these fights are happening here? Yeah. Okay. The lane. Okay. Cool. So, like, I just but want wasn't you. It... Go ahead. Sorry. Like, wasn't it just at the tier two? But like, I then I just went and like farmed the passive like offline jungle farm and then they just like push it out with five heroes and then it's like back to where it was before i pushed it out so i see what you're saying so let's go ahead and review this so you see three mid you see the doom tp top you see them coming towards top So, I'm 
No, this is actually such a hard subject to teach. I haven't really worried about teaching this before. Okay. Uh, how do I word this? So what you did up until pushing the lane was correct, right? Like, that was good. Yeah. So when you were allowing one hero to defend this while four heroes were showing bottom, why was I saying that was so bad? Because he's by himself. And what does it do for the other four heroes? They can just fight my team, do whatever they want. They would do whatever they want. Do you see what's happening right now? No, they just flipped it, now they're top. And what's the, happening, that's the problem. The invoker's by himself. Okay. So, what did you do wrong? I should run at the invoker now, as opposed to fighting them top. And as opposed to what? Fighting them top. Oh, hitting neutrals? Yeah! Okay. So... So, like, um... The problem that you guys in your bracket, I mean, even people in my bracket face, is they do what you did. They see the enemy team do this. Like, you're not going to push top, right? So, you're, like, you're not going to push top because you saw Doom TP. Um, you saw, like, three heroes walking through a ward to top. So, what does that effectively do for your top lane? Like, it puts you on a timer, okay? Like, it means 30 seconds from now, the enemy is threatening... To hit your tier one, right? Is that that's effectively yeah. what happens? So, in that type of spot, the enemy's telegraphing it too, right? Like they're not being secretive about it. They've shown you, and this is the kind of stuff that can get punished so heavily. It's ridiculous. Okay, like that's this is the kind of stuff that I like. That if you do this in my bracket, you're, they're feeding. Like they're actually going to feed if you walk three heroes through a ward, and the other guy is walking down the lane like they're doing, because. What that says to me is, okay, so they're threatening top. So if I don't want to lose immediate map control, what do I have to do if the enemy team is threatening a tower? What were they doing here? What did I have to do when they were here? You had to pressure top. I had to threaten this. So what do I have to do when they threaten this? Push up bottom. The opposite lane. Whatever. I have to threaten something. I have to threaten something. I can't just let them group up and say, do what you guys want. Do you right. see what I'm saying? So you get this, you get this opportunity. Uh, let's, let's check this out here. So you saw this happening. Right here, you know your tower is on a 30-second pressure. You know that, right? Like that's, This yeah. is when you know, okay? Like right this moment because you see this guy had TP'd and you see there are two supports walking to the top. So are you going to be able to get to bottom soon enough to pressure? No. And if you were to TP bottom, couldn't they just, like, TP Bloodseeker plus one and kill you? Sure. So is bottom an option? Not really. No. Not for me. Not, I mean, it, it, but for the most part, it, not for your team either. Because nobody on your team is going to be able to pressure that. Like, who else on your team pressures towers? Uh, nobody. Nobody. So, like, now that option's removed. So it's mid, right? Like, that's what it has to be. It has yeah. to be mid, right? And that seems reasonable. By the time Doom gets here, can this lane be at their tower? Yeah. So, if I see Doom in top lane and two heroes walking to the top lane, what am I thinking about anybody on their team that steps foot in the mid lane? You kill them. They should be dead as shit, okay? Like, to three heroes. Like, your heroes are there. Like, they are there. Like, you're, they're already pushing the wave for you. So, like, in this case, if I'm the guy pushing the wave, I just need this guy to show up here. So, I'll sit, like... In, in good players, like, if you go to high enough tiers, this shit, this, people know this shit naturally. Like, they don't have to be told. Like, the times where I'm telling people to do shit that I get really frustrated is when I'm like, God, you guys should just know this. They're, like, rank 100 or something. And I'm like, I shouldn't have to tell you this. Like, I'm pushing mid, and they're grouping top. Like, why are you, you know, like, what? Yeah. Um, and, like, but you're 5K, so, like, these are the type of advanced things. Like, these are hard things. These are hard. So these are the type of things that you actually have to get better at. So the main, the main message I want to give you is when the opponent is presenting themselves with a threat, it is imperative that you immediately threaten them with something yourself. Because otherwise, they just group up and do whatever they want. Um, that, like, that's the big deal, right? When we're talking about bottom, the only reason there's an awkward fight is because you're not threatening top. When they're threatening top, the only reason there's an awkward fight is because you didn't immediately threaten mid. Like, and your role in this... In terms of like buying detection or whatever, like what items you buy, 
how you play the map that it all comes into this like understanding you know who threatens who like who shows in lane while who like who's the plus one like generally i would say that um you know what od's doing is kind of bad i feel like this should be a support with od pushing mid and your sand king playing off map so that your sand king is like a threat but he's just gonna do this and like this is really bad too what your supports are like but why is that happening why was sand king showing mid because the wave wasn't pushed because od's not <laughs> right like that the exact you said the wave wasn't pushed and the wave's not pushed because the guy that's supposed to be pushing it isn't pushing it so i can show you all five players on your team fucking up at once like i can show you it like it's happening right like this guy should be pushing mid you should have pushed top like you did sand king should be playing off map here you two should meet right here and anyone who shows up mid just fucking dies like and you may say bsj they have a war in a center here okay so if they have a war in center here and they see you and sand king walking through it are they grouping up as four top nope if they do, they lose the tower. Like, worst case scenario, like, yeah, they lose tower, right? Um, and they trade. In that case, like, you'd much rather trade this for this. Like, that's just a way better trade for you guys. So, the point is, like, your team's not always going to do the right thing. But you need to do the right thing. So, even though it's not perfectly executed, since you're in 5k, if you and if San King walks down mid pushing it, and you TP here, this, or, like, sorry, if you, if you walk here, and I'd probably walk this way because of the people you saw. I'd like walk the this way, not this way. Um, and if you walk that way, even more so, you saw that Doom TP top. So if you force him to go somewhere else immediately, you know he's walking and you know it's going to be very slow. So the benefit of you push, pushing this lane and forcing them to be there is that a minute they TP, you can go somewhere else. And then if that guy wants to show up, he's walking. Like if you TP here and a fight goes on here, isn't that super bad for your team generally? Like if you TP, if I TP top and the fight's bottom. Yeah. Yeah, I can't. I can't be there. Yeah, right. So like, why not do the same thing to them? This guy just TP top. Why not force something here? You know, like that's the put it yourself in their perspective. Like if you force something here, this guy immediately has to do this. And guess what's even better about that? You, see you have a ward that shows the path that he would have to take to get to you. So then it's like super obvious. And if they do that, so here I'm just point, playing this out for you. This lane's gonna push in. You saw this guy TP top, so like the point of pu applying pressure here is that you force someone to show up here, okay? So what forcing someone to show up here does is it makes this area safer, right? Yeah. So, But it's not good enough for you to force them here and then just like TP bottom and let them take this tower because like I said, you're not going to get to this tower before they do. Right. Because you're doing it as a reactionary thing. So the natural progress that you'll see players do, force TPs, walk to mid, force the collapse on mid, Walk bottom, push it out, TP top, recycle. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. You're okay. Because like, what's going to happen is by the time you get bottom, you'll push the lane into their tower, and then this lane's going to be at your tower again because you let them push it out. And then you TP to it, and then you resume. Right? And so the idea is if you do this and you're pushing in this lane after you force them back mid, their two choices are to chase you bottom or to go back top. So if they chase you bottom, you immediately TP top. If they don't chase you bottom, then you just keep pushing it. And if they choose to take this, then guess what you're threatening? Yay, right? Yeah. Like, you see what I'm saying? It's all about yeah. constantly threatening something. Because if you're not threatening anything, the other team just does whatever they want. So let's go ahead and play this out. This is something I have not taught on stream before, so... Oh, this is super useful. Okay, so... Now you're in an awkward fight top. So the beauty of these type of decisions is, um, I still mess these things up, right? Like that's it's it's stuff that's very like it is complicated for me to even explain to you. So it's 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 tough. The difference between your bracket and mine. What do you think the difference is in this regard to these decisions between your bracket and mine? I probably have more time. You have more time to process these decisions. Like that's what it is. So you may say BSJ, like you know, do I need this? Like if people are watching, does this knowledge help me? It's like. Well, yeah, you guys actually have, like, if you're 2K, they probably have 45 seconds to process this decision, actually. For you, it's probably about 15, 10 seconds. For me, it's actually three. Like, I'm not even, like, sometimes less. Like, when I'm playing, it's, when you're playing against these tier one teams that I've played against before, like, when you're making these decisions, it's fucking overwhelming. 
Because it's like trying to run a mile twice as fast as you're used to running it. You're like, yeah. holy moly, I have to operate so quickly, and by the time I've made my decision, it's already too late. And it's just because they think the shit faster than I do. Like, that's like that's all it is. Like, they're just more experienced. They're better at it. They, like, have more clear-cut understanding of exactly what their hero does in the game. And they'll make this decision twice as, twice as fast as I do. So now you TP bottom. So, like, you get to bottom eventually, and this is where you should have been. But it should have been by virtue of walking to mid, then bottom. And now it's super awkward because Invoker's pushing in your bottom lane. All three lanes are at your towers. Which we've talked about is, like, you know. So we finally get Invoker killed. And you go jungle. So this is a spot where you need to threaten something while he's dead. So, obviously you're down by 8k. You're not threatening bottom lane because it's only here. So... You farm. I don't mind you farming these two camps because the wave mid is like not there yet. So once this wave mid gets there, you need to walk mid. But you need to be careful. I'd send some Manta Illusions at it. Just force them to show something. Okay, they're showing something. That's honestly the best you can do because you guys are down by 8k. So that's good enough for me. That seems so simple, but you actually need to have that. Because what if they just immediately show two heroes on a ward? You need to go hit that mid tower. You need to be like close enough to it that you're threatening it. Okay, so they're taking a fight... So they're kind of throwing good patience, but isn't going to... Yeah, you're just not ready to fight yet. Immediately walk top. This is good. No hesitations. Oh, you had no TP. That's a yikes. You guys end up winning this, huh? Yeah, big comeback here. We get a free rush. They just hand yeah. you rush. Yeah, they were pitching bottom. And usually the reason why playing Radiant's easier than Dire, by the way, is because on Radiant, you don't always need to threaten this tier 2. You just take Roche. On Dire, you actually usually have to threaten a tower. On Radiant, you have, like, that third choice, yeah. um, which can make the game easier to play. Like, there's some games on stream where I'll be harping on, like, guys, we just need to threaten Roche. We don't actually have to do it. And it's because, like, we're actually preventing... The reason I'm doing that is I'm preventing the opponent from pushing rather than um, trying to actually take Roche. Uh, for the same reasons we've been talking about. So yeah, I mean, you're just down, so you're trying to farm. I don't have much to say about that death. Let's watch. They have a Radiance Doom, huh? I think in this game, Manta was a little too luxurious of an item, by the way. I think you kind of just had to go BKB with the way the game was going. Yeah, I agree. Makes sense. Uh, so they just show bottom and give you a free rush. And you guys take a fight and turn it, I guess, in your own base? Yeah, I'd like to keep the energy. Yeah. Okay, so to give you the maximum out of your time, we got about, I believe, 15 minutes left. So, um, do you have another game to watch real quick? Yeah, I have a Stark replay. Cool, cool. So we'll try as much as we can. Usually it's uh, overlapping points. Like Usually if I have a player, they'll make the similar mistakes every game. It'll obviously look a bit different on every hero. Um, and that's important for you to understand. Not, like, it's the questions you need to ask yourself. Every hero is different. Certain heroes apply tower pressure. Certain heroes apply Roche. Certain heroes apply kill pressure. Like... Whatever it is, you know, like, what is your role in that? Like, if you're a Monkey King in this case, it was really important that you immediately went mid and, like, scouted behind their tower and, like, stunned anybody that was there. That kind of thing. Like, or a Slark. You could have Shadow Blade wrapped around their Tier two, tier 1 and, like, threatened anybody who showed up. Uh, very, you know, as Terror Blade, you're the guy walking down the lane that's setting up for somebody else on your team to do that. Okay, so, let's see. You're against Axe. Dazzle, maybe Undying. I think it's Undying this game. So in this game, I'm waiting to level level 1 because I would I would consider pack level 1 against Dazzle. But uh, against, against Undying Axe, I definitely want my passive. So we see... I think we saw both. So in that case, I, would, wouldn't, I wouldn't level Essence Shift yet, but I'm ready to level Essence Shift. Okay, I see what you tried to do there. Thought was there, it's fine. Okay. Every hero is different. How how many games of Stark do you have? Just give me an idea. Total. 50 or 60. 50. Okay. 
So, did this guy spin? He did spin. Okay. So, the way I look at this is when you have a low HP range, like when your range is in front, right here, as Slark, what do you think is probably the best option right now? Rather than trying to deny this creep. Just hit the axe. Just hit him. Like, especially, should you be trying to draw a creep aggro or not trying to draw a creep aggro? Uh, I mean, if I do draw a creep aggro, then the creeps won't hit it. Yeah, won't and that the makes creep. this creep stay alive longer, right? Yeah. So it allows you to hit him more. Yeah. So, like, whenever this happens, like, I would immediately start hitting him right here. And if he levels spin, okay, give it to him. Back off. Like, he leveled spin, and your willow should start hitting him. Like, if she doesn't hit him, then so be it. Like, you're, she's supposed to hit him. Um, and the second he kills the wave, like, you should be hitting him again. Um, just every hero is different, right? Like, Slark and Huskar, you should hit the guy more than you look to deny. Um, what happens eventually is you'll hit the guy enough that he'll be forced to back off, and then you'll get the deny, because he's forced to back off. Obviously, Axe is a little bit different, but I would beg to differ that if you're outside of a creep wave, I, I'm not, I'm 100% sure. If you're outside of a creep wave, like, your creeps weren't hitting him yet, you'll win the trades if you're hitting him with Essence Shift on. Like, you'll, you'll win the trades. So it's like... That's something you have to gauge, but like I know from Slark experience. But in general, with heroes like Slark, Huskar, Monkey King, um, Ursa, it's generally just better to hit the guy than it is to try to deny. So just think about it that way. It's something that immediately comes to mind. With PA, that's not really the case. So. Obviously, if there's two heroes, things change, right? So... Never level pounce level one. It's actually so game losing. The only lane I might level it against is a Grimstroke lane that I have no intention of hitting anybody. Okay. I did it once recently and I was like, yikes. Lost the lane because of it. It just doesn't do anything for you. It's a 30 damage nuke that doesn't harass it. Like, it, you don't actually harass it all with Pounce if you don't have Essence Shift. Like, Essence Shift is the only way you actually win trades. So, just for anyone and yourself, that's why. Okay, so, pretty standard. You remind me a lot of myself, like, a lot of mistakes you make. Just very passive. Like, just like an example on the map. The example at the level 1 where you didn't hit the axe. Usually they're pretty applying all game. Like if you're a carry player like myself used to be that kind of just sat back and got the farm and that was my goal, it tends to show also in the mid game. Like you'll be very passive when you could be aggressive. Uh, just telling you in general for going forward from this, like right now you're doing the right thing so I'm not commenting on your gameplay specifically. But uh, you need to look to, like if you're questioning whether or not you can be aggressive, you just need to do it even if you randomly feed sometimes. Okay. It'll, if you don't start pushing the limits, the limits will just never go up. So if you, like, have some friends you'd party queue with or something, like, it might help you in the short term to do that. Like, if you don't mind losing MMR to do this, it's fine. But I'm just telling you, if you start trying to play more aggressively than you're used to, it'll probably result in a short-term loss of MMR. Because you'll just feed at times that you normally wouldn't have fed. I mean, overall, like, your creep aggro usage and stuff is good, so none of that stuff needs to work on. Like, I feel like if I were to put you in a lane where you're supposed to just play passively and creep aggro for CS, like, you'd do fine. Like, uh, you'd do very well. But, like, I also feel like if you're in a lane where the only way you're ever going to win it is by hitting the guy 20 times at level 1, you'll never win that lane. That's, like, an example of the exact problems I used to have. Do you play anti-mage a lot? Yeah. Do you like it? Like, do you feel like you're, like, do you have success with anti-mage? Yeah. Okay. Which is, I don't know. I mean, I, that's just because I split push. I think I just think I'm better than people split push. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Definitely not because of the laning. Yeah, I was going to say, you probably, I feel like you would struggle in lane on anti-mage, but play well in the mid game. So I was wondering on anti-mage if you generally have like a rough start, but then you just get more farm. That's how I feel like it would go, but you know, maybe I'm, I'm not, I'm just guessing. No, uh, uh, that's right. Probably. Just yeah, really. a guess. So, this is good. Overall, you get a TP from your mid PA. Oh, 
So this is a spot where, do I want a land against X? No. I probably would have even just packed these creeps. Like, I would have killed the creeps as soon as possible. And then, I, I see here that he's not here. Okay, we packed. Cool, cool, cool. I just want you to be in the right mindset that you have no desire to land against Axe. So you get your treads, you go to the go to the big camp, cool. So like if you had packed it that first wave, this is an example of something where you would have killed that neutral creep. Like it seems so small, but you would have been to that neutral camp one second earlier. Like it's just yeah. such small things. Like it's a sense of urgency, but you see it there paying like you know, it, it shows itself. So, okay, moving on. You see them fighting. You don't really want to... Sh I wouldn't really show up to this. So you push the wave. Nice. Okay. That's good. Fast forwarding. Okay, good you didn't farm that camp. I don't mind the stack. I was going to harp on you if you farmed it. Because you know what your role is when you're not wanting to far like when you're not wanting to contest the offlaner, right? Just defend the tower. Yep, just defend the tower. Good shit will happen if you defend the tower. So let's see here. Walk down lane and pack it because you're safe. Good. All of this is good. This is exactly how Slark plays. I actually don't like that TP at all. Yeah. I to be honest, I actually just forgot that the life stealer can just like infest a creep. Okay. Like I saw him use rage, and I was like, oh, maybe I can actually kill him. So how do I feel about you walking all the way back top here? Uh, I don't know. I mean, just what is your thought process to walk back top here? I don't want to stay bottom, and I can defend top for a little bit longer, so I stayed. So, in hindsight, do you think this is a good choice? To walk back top? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I need you to have some confidence in your decision, right? Yeah, this is really good, actually. So, like, remember how I said that was a bad TB bottom? Yeah. 90% I mean, of players I deal with, even in your bracket, they make that bad TP, and they just accept it was a bad TP. It's the same idea as um, when your lane was bad in the first game, and I said take the brief sacrifice in order to fix things where you just single pull it and fix the lane same idea here just because you tp'd wrong does not mean you should stay there right take this yeah. 20 seconds of inefficiency to walk back top because that's where you're supposed to be okay so i'm being clear to everyone watching that this is very important that when you make a bad tp because you're supposed to stay top that you walk all the way back top and so i'm giving you confidence in your own decision that that is absolutely correct you do not accept that the TP was bad and you just stay bottom. That is false. So this is good. You walk back top. I like. I don't mind that. You make a TP. You forgot something. Like you. You know. You thought you could threaten the guy. You couldn't. Like even really good players make that mistake. So like really good players. Um, I don't like that you're farming the stack because you need to be at your tower sooner. It's too late to defend your tower now. In this type of spot, um, it's really hard to walk past their off laner. You know what I'm saying? It's really hard to walk through him. So in that situation, you actually have to be at your tower before the creeps get there. So like, just have that as your internal timer for jungling. So you stack again, you, this, this second you should check the wave. That, like when I first stacked it, I did. This time I didn't. Yeah, that's what I mean. And you made the right choice, right? Yeah. So just be consistent, you know? Check your wave. Same thing. You see them bottom, you know you're allowed to be there, but now you're too late to get to the, to get to the tower. I do this sometimes. But as you go up in MMR, it just happens less and less. That's the goal. Less and less. You can make these mistakes. It's just like, you know, you did it once this game instead of twice. Like, you did it once correct and once incorrect. You're actually just losing a tower because you chose to farm the jungle camp. Uh, you're actually walking back top, though. So you could have lost that tower. You took, like, 800 damage on that tower because you chose to farm a jungle camp five seconds longer than you should have. That's just an example. Okay, so... Other than that, I'm fine with everything. Life Stealer shows up in your lane. Does he threaten you? No. Let's rewind. Did we see Axe? We saw Axe, right? We did. Okay, so why am I checking Axe, by the way? Why he's, did... the, he's my threat. Okay, so like, would Life Stealer threaten me if Axe is off map? Yeah. Okay, so that's why I'm bringing this up. Same idea here. 
Don't let this guy push your lane in. He doesn't threaten you. Walk back. Push out the lane once. That bounty rune will be there. Like, to be frank, if you walk here and you see him walking over to the bounty rune, just go get it. If he's pushing the lane, then you push the lane too. Because you'll go get it first, right? Um, it's just an idea of uh, re like the same concept that I'm rehashing on Slark. Think about your threats. Like, Don't let them just push lanes. It's very important. Like the guy shouldn't be casually pushing lanes. Okay. So, re-emphasizing there again. That you're giving this guy tower pressure on your own safe lane while his team is showing bottom. This is an example where if that lifestealer was like a terror blade, you'd lose your tier 1 already. Like, you're not really getting punished for it all that much because it's a lifestealer. It doesn't like change the fact that you shouldn't do it, right? But if it was a terror blade, you would have lost your tier 1 already because of your decision. Like, showing up to this fight is perfectly fine. My emphasis is take care of your duties top first, right? Like, kill the wave, then go to this fight. That's that's all I'm harping on, to be clear. Okay. Um... Yeah, you definitely needed to have a TP on you there. I'm not saying you needed the TP, you just needed to have one. Because if you have a TP, aren't you just willing to hit this tier 2? Like, aren't you just willing to hit this if you have a TP? Like, yeah. on you? So I need you to think about, like, what having a TP offers you. So, like, the reason why... I, I know it seems so obvious you should have a TP. But, like, you have two heroes dead. And you want the option to stay here longer. And as long as Axe has... As long as Axe isn't there, you can ult TP out of anything. And so, like, they have very little catch for you. That You should be a ton of tower pressure, even though you're a Slark. Because as long as you see Axe, like, he's just so much tower pressure. And you could have TP'd in potentially right there on top of Dazzle. Axe is already initiated. Um, and you're a Slark that only dies to Axe Call, right? So that was a spot where you need opportune moments to TP because you just feel really awkward walking at these kind of fights. I can just tell you, like, when you've seen a fight break out already and you just walking there, it's just bad. Like, this yeah. is just never good. So that's just a matter of making sure you have the discipline to have TPs on you. Um, so what I think about this, honestly, is I was going to harp on it earlier and I decided not to. Is... Is... You see two mid, you see lifestealer top. Is Axe a threat to you alone? No, I guess. But I, I definitely thought Axe could... If I didn't see Axe, my idea was don't push a lane. I didn't think that far. Okay. Like, I actually... I just didn't think that far. So I'm like, glad you thought. With blade mail, right? Yeah, I'm being very clear. I'm glad you thought. But he doesn't have a blade mail yet, first off. Right. He, he like just got his blink as a vanguard. But like secondly, I was like, this was on the edge, but I knew it was bad when I saw it, but I wasn't sure if I should mention it. That's that's I'm giving you my honest opinion. Is here is a really important spot where you see two mid and top is under the same threat that we talked about earlier, right? Like, of Axe missing? No, like of, uh, in 30 seconds from now, it's going to be at your tower. Okay. Okay? So it's the same idea. It's the same idea. Like, this lane's going to be in your tower, because none of your heroes are there, and they have a life stealer, and all of the heroes are occupied. So if equal amount of heroes are occupied mid, and this guy is freely pushing this tower, like, eventually he's going to threaten it, you also have to threaten this. Think of how awkward it is for Axe to TP bottom and get a plus one. And then you can just go top and bully this guy out. Because Axe is the only threat on your entire map for you. You, okay. see, you see like my line of reasoning here? Yeah. So it's like, if you don't force him to actually show himself on the tower when it's not... Like, you said you thought Axe is a threat. I shouldn't show myself if he's missing. Like, I think that's good. Like, that's important that you're thinking that. Now think of how awkward it is for the opponent to bring, like, three heroes bottom. Like, and how it's not going to happen instantly. So this is a spot where I've been taught you have to threaten it. You don't necessarily have to hit it. You have to threaten it. So like at this very moment right here, 
is actually where the f problem begins. If you want to be ultra efficient, Quelling Blade this tree, stack this camp, and then go hit the tower. You don't have the luxury to kill this camp. Because of this. Black's dead. You don't have this luxury to kill this camp. And you may say, BSJ, I have low mana, I have no ult. You have stick, and who the fuck kills you right now? Like, nobody yeah, does. Nope. So, if you want to be ultra efficient and push it, this is what I meant by efficiency can actually hurt you. You're thinking, I need to kill every creep camp. It's 1651, right? Like, I need to kill every camp. I can't tell you how many times I've watched better players than myself, like, f not kill this camp, and been like, God, they could have killed this camp. It's 1650. And instead, they're hitting this tower. And it's like, what I'm saying is over-efficiency can really be bad. Like, it can be very bad. So, overall, like, uh, something you'll probably notice in your games over time is you're taking way too long to get towers. Like, um, so the fact that you chose to do this instead of hitting tower then leads to you doing this, which then leads to just nothing happening bottom. Okay, and it just feels bad. And so it takes you, like, two minutes extra to get this tower. And it seems like such a small thing, but like in that two minutes, a lot's going to happen. Like even this guy just walking down top lane, them setting up an infest gank on your top lane. Like they're even honestly being a little stupid about this in my opinion. I don't think they need to do this. And then they get a good fight mid. Why? Because they're infested waiting. And meanwhile, you're now taking the tower. You see the difference here? Yeah. Cool. Moving on. Uh, we got about three minutes left. Do you have any last questions before we call this session a wrap? Um, I guess just like I have like a list of heroes that like I'll just like play in pubs. Okay. For like grinding MMR, I have Naga, Slark, AM just because I really like him and PA. Okay, Naga, Slark, AM, and PA. Okay. Yeah. You think that's fine? Um, for now, yeah. I think what my goal is that you should understand every hero that's good in a patch. So, um. I give myself like one or two mulligans, meaning like if there's just one or two carries, I can't stand or just really bad at playing, like overall in the entire game. Like, fine. Like, you can tell me you just can't play Slark for the life of you, whatever. The point is, like, in every patch, if Jug's the most broken hero or whatever, you should be able to play him. If, if Nog is the most broken hero, you should be able to play her. Right now, I'd say PA, Slark, Naga, and AM is a fine kit of heroes. But, like, if a new patch rolls around. You know, you need to be able to play whatever those are. Okay. Um, that's my example I'm giving you. Like, don't be locked in. Like, I'd say five heroes a patch is good yeah, for someone around your bracket. Like, uh, if you're trying to climb and you're trying to get better at these overall game concepts, I think five heroes per patch is fine. Um, but eventually you'll have to learn more. But I think, like, prioritizing, like, limiting your hero pool and learning the stuff I'm telling you now is better. Okay. I think that is better. So, um... Just, once again, the highlight I have from this session is emphasize land pressure. Like, a lot of it has to do with being there before the pressure's there. So, like, notice how I said this lane was impending doom, right? And then they made a move, and then it ended up working out mid. In the other game, I told you about this lane being pressured towards you. This lane being pressured. It's all telegraphed. Like, players in your bracket will give you more time to figure it out than they should. So, the point is, get start thinking about it now and realizing if the lane's pressured... You have to try to do something. Like, if there's absolutely nothing you can do because you're down by 15,000 gold or whatever, so be it. But I'm saying in an evenish game, you have to be able to do something. And immediately try to tell yourself what that is. And if you don't know during the game, try to look back on the game and figure it out. Um, so I like that you're thinking about Axe. But also, like, imagine if Axe is forced to TP bottom off his respawn. You, This is a spot where if you had just threatened this tower, and then by the, the second Axe respawn, you back off. You're gonna be. You're gonna know ten seconds from now where he is, and during that ten seconds, you're gonna be farming these two camps. If he goes bottom, you can immediately run mid or top or TP top. And if he's not bottom, you just take the tower, right? And then you'll have taken that tower already before this fight breaks out. Maybe you've already wrapped on mid, and at that point, you're there. Like it's not a coincidence when really good carry players are just at fights at the right time. It's like the stuff that led up to the fight that makes them there at the right time. So, um, yeah. Any last questions, man? No. Cool. I feel like that was a good session, so I hope yeah, you uh, you have a lot to work on. So I'm gonna uh, prioritizing lane pressure. I think is uh, or prioritizing threatening objectives will be uh, like what I put on the caption of this uh, sword PA. Okay, cool, man. Uh, thanks for signing up, and I'll see you around. Yeah, thank you.